Kratos is one of modern gaming's most iconic characters, thanks to his design, fast-paced hack-and-slash gameplay, and his penchant for murdering gods and mythical creatures in ways more gloriously brutal than you ever knew were possible. Across the seven games in the God of War franchise, he turns the act of murder into a genuine art form. And given that his last outing was a straight-up masterpiece, I am just as excited as everyone else is for God of War Ragnarok! Okay, fine. Maybe I'm a little more excited than most people. Merry Ragnarok! <laughs> Hey everyone, Gerard the Completionist here because Kratos himself couldn't make it. By which I mean I didn't have time to sit through three hours of makeup to look like what I did for our show, God of Work, which you can watch on my YouTube channel right now, but that doesn't mean you should question my dedication to the Kratos lifestyle. I still have the kick-ass axe though, which I will be holding for the rest of this video because literally everything is cooler when you're holding an axe. See, told ya. Anyways, we here at G4 know that you regularly say to yourself, boy, I wish there was a way that was convenient to remember every god that Kratos murders in the entirety of the God of War franchise. So, that's why we assembled a list of his gruesome, wildly inventive deicides into a catchy and simple rap that you could, sorry, did, rap. We're doing a rap? Okay, I thought it was gonna be a chronicle of Kratos' life through the lens of all the gods he's killed, not a rap. I changed it. It's a rap now, so. Gabrielle, no one wants to see me do a rap. Also, do you know how hard it is to rhyme with Hephaestus? Oh, oh my god, Hephaestus, he's the bestest, asbestos, you could go on and on. See, this shit's easy. Oh my god, I'll just do it myself. See you at the end of the video. Ready to have your mind blown. Well, at least you have that to look forward to. Kratos kills numerous gods throughout the series, with a track record that would put Christian Bale's Gore the God Butcher to shame. He's not the only one who gets to murder gods and wear white body paint, all right? But Kratos does not discriminate when it comes to murder, as countless monsters, mythical beings, and even regular ass dudes can attest. So real quick, before we dig into Deicide, I want to go through a few of Kratos' other murders, some of which it generally hurt to leave off of this list. These are legendary beasts or mythical figures who don't quite qualify as gods, but I would never say that to their faces. Like the Basilisk, which Kratos kills by pulling its jaws together so hard that its head explodes. Or the legendary Kraken, which he kills by shoving a literal bridge down its throat. Or the Hydra that he killed with the ship mast. Ooh, or Pandora's Guardian, an undead minotaur that he impaled with a ballista and then used it to decorate his throne room. Anyways, you get the point. Kratos hates gods most of all, but he's not above murdering giant monsters in wildly creative ways. There's also the Colossus of Rhodes, which is a statue, but not a monster. However, it is a very famous statue, so we thought about putting it on this list but decided against it. We also left out mortals of legend who are deeply associated with myths, but can't claim godhood for themselves. Like Icarus, whose wings Kratos rips off before casting him into the underworld, because the dude clearly did not get the memo that his whole myth is a cautionary tale. Or Mimir from God of War 2018, who is the smartest man in the world, but technically is not a god. Also, after cutting his head off, Kratos brings it back to life, so it's still technically murder, but the nice kind of murder? Is there a nice kind of murder? All right, now that all those mediocre mortals and middling monsters are out of the way, we can start working our way through the Pantheon like we are Kratos himself. Although I should point out that we do include demigods because the word God is literally still in there. Leave me alone, everyone. All right, with that out of the way, here we go. We're gonna be going in chronological order of Kratos' experience from this point on, which means we're gonna start with God of War Ascension, even though it was the last game released in the Greek era on the PS3 in 2013. It's set only six months after Ares tricks Kratos into killing his family and wearing their ashes as body paint, which means the Ghost of Sparta is understandably carrying around a lot of new pent-up rage. I mean, he'll be carrying that rage literally forever, but at least six months into it, I'm sure it was really extra ragey. The first gods to experience that rage are Castor and Pollux, although technically only Pollux is a demigod. But as the Gemini twins, they're literally connected to each other, so it seems rude to separate them. Kratos has never really worried about being rude though, and separating them is exactly what he does. Pollux is still a powerful sorcerer without his brother, but Castor was the muscle of the two. They're able to manipulate time in their battle against Kratos, but no amount of time manipulation 
can undo having your head squished by Kratos' foot, which is exactly the fate that awaits Pollux after his brother falls to his death. Not a bad start as far as god murder is concerned, but Castor and Pollux are small potatoes compared to Ascension's main villains, the Furies. The Furies are comprised of Megara, Tisiphone, and Electo, all of which you've probably been familiar with if you've ever played Hades. These versions are way less chill though, which is really saying something, because even in Hades, Tisiphone literally only says the word murder. Murderer. But in God of War Ascension, the Furies are, for lack of a better word, furious with Kratos for breaking his oath to Ares, because it turns out that being tricked into killing your own family is kind of a deal breaker. The first of the Furies to fall to Kratos' blades is Megara, who has way more spider legs than the similarly named character from Disney's Hercules, so don't even ask. Kratos takes on Megara at the same time as Aegeon, one of the Hecaton Shires. Hecaton Grease. So good luck to Gabrielle finding a rhyme for that one. The Hecaton Shires are massive ancient giants with 50 heads and hundreds of arms. And this one was turned into a prison where the Furies keep their enemies, which is just not a chill thing to do, even to a gross evil giant. Megira even turns Aegeon's severed hands into equally gross monsters because the dude just can't catch a break. But thankfully, Aegeon goes down when Megira does falling from a great height that would already be deadly even if Kratos wasn't stabbing her in the chest at the same time. But you know, he was, just to be sure. The other two sisters caused trouble for Kratos throughout the rest of the game, culminating in a large-scale battle where Electo turns into a monster because of course she does. But after f***ing up the beast with the ship's mass, which is apparently something he makes a habit of, he cuts Electo's human form in half just to be safe. That only leaves Tisiphone and her illusions, which are almost enough to stop Kratos from killing her. But he sees right through them and strangles her to death. Because sometimes the old ways are the best ways, and you can't go wrong with the good old fashioned strangling. All right, that sounded way creepier than I intended. I'm really sorry. The last god that Kratos kills in God of War Ascension is Orcos, the son of Ares and Electo. But this one is less fun because it's Orko's idea. Orko's was never the warrior that Ares wanted him to be, which is why Ares built up Kratos into an unstoppable murder machine. But by stabbing Arcos at his request, Kratos severs his bond to Ares at the cost of restoring some incredibly painful memories. That brings us to the other prequel, God of War Chains of Olympus for the PlayStation Portable, which we're not gonna talk about too much because even though it's pretty damn good, it feels so removed from the rest of the series. And also because it's relatively light on god murder since it's set during the period of time where Kratos was serving the gods instead of murdering them. In fact, one of the two gods killed in the game might not even technically be a god. It's Charon, the ferryman who ushers souls into the underworld and whose name sounds much like Sharon. So that's what I'm just gonna call him going forward. He's Sharon. He's empowered by Persephone, the game's main antagonist, and Kratos kills him by beating him to death with the Gauntlet of Zeus, after stabbing him with his own scythe for good measure. You know, Kratos kills Persephone with the Gauntlet as well, because much like Strangulation, you just can't go wrong with caving someone's face in. I'm not a murderer, you guys, I swear. Persephone's goal is to use the Titan Atlas to destroy both the world and all of the gods, a goal that Kratos himself couldn't quite relate to just yet at this point in his journey. But before disintegrating, she tells him, Your suffering will never end. And having played all the later games in the series, yeah, yeah, she's not wrong. But that does get us through all the prequels and into the game that started it all, 2005's God of War for the PS2. Now, Kratos actually only kills one god in this game, and you'll never guess who it is. Okay, yeah, it's fine. It's the God of War, Ares. Good guess. He also kills Medusa, which isn't a god, but she's extremely famous, and he rips her head off with his bare hands, which felt like it was still worth mentioning. So here I am, mentioning it. But yeah, the headlining act of this game is definitely Kratos' showdown with Ares, the god who ruined his life in order to turn him into the perfect warrior. Okay, yeah, there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the TLDR version. The rivalry between Kratos and Ares actually goes back to when Kratos was a child, and Ares tries to abduct his brother Deimos, mistakenly believing that he was the subject of a prophecy that, you guessed it, actually referred to Kratos. But their beef really kicked off when Ares gave Kratos his iconic Blades of Chaos and empowered him to decimate an army of barbarians, a bloodlust that eventually led to the murder of his own family. For years, Kratos sought revenge against Ares, but he's, you know, a god. 
Unfortunately, the other gods all agreed that Ares is a huge dick who was plotting with the Furies and working against the Pantheon because he just loved war too damn much. Eventually though, after 10 years of service to the gods, Athena recruited Kratos to find Pandora's box and kill Ares, which isn't as easy as it sounds, and it doesn't sound particularly easy. Ares even managed to kill Kratos for a bit, but that did not last long. Eventually, with the help of the other gods, Kratos used the Pandora's box to grow to humongous sizes and do a great face-off with Ares, who grew also a bunch of gross spider legs out of his back, because that's apparently a thing that every god in this universe can do, and that's not cool! No more spiders in the god universe, all right? After getting trapped in a memory of when he killed his family and getting his Blades of Chaos taken, it seemed like Kratos was down and out. But there were seven more games, so you know he wasn't. He managed to get a hold of the Blade of the Gods, which wasn't a sword so much as a huge goddamn bridge in the shape of a sword, which means Kratos has used multiple ship masses and bridges to kill multiple entities. He's a monster. He ran the bridge through Ares' chest, which wasn't quite as creative and gross as some of his other kills, but at least had a decade of emotional weight behind it, so it sort of balances out. After killing Ares, Kratos takes his place as the God of War, which is not only poetic, but also allow the series to keep its name and have it make sense. So everybody wins. Well, everyone except Ares, I guess. Well, he was a dick, so that's okay. See, balances itself out. Next up, God of War Ghost of Sparta, another portable title release for the PlayStation Portable in 2010. Kratos doesn't kill that many gods in this one either, but the two that he does kill both have gross weird appendages that aren't spider legs, but they're close enough for me to be very mad at it. Remember a bit earlier when I mentioned that Ares took Kratos' brother when they were kids? Well, Deimos ended up with Thanatos, the god of death, which is just never somewhere you want to end up. When the newly god-appointed Kratos finds out about this, he sets out on a quest to kill the god of death and get his brother back. But first, he has to deal with Thanatos' daughter, Aranus. And look, being raised by the god of death can't be easy, but it's no excuse to be an asshole, by the way. Aranus tries hunting Kratos to warn him off of his quest, but then Kratos ripped her wings off, and that's not the last time you'll hear me say that sentence, because Kratos loves ripping wings off. But she grew new ones and turned into a giant monster, and that's also not the last time you'll hear that sentence because all the gods in these games love turning into giant freaking monsters. This particular beastie is a big armored raven, which at least isn't a spider, so that's something. But after plunging his blades into the armor's weak spot, Aranus reverts to human form. So he tears off her wings again, and I bet you thought we're gonna have to wait a lot longer to hear me say that. Then he plunges his blade into her back and moves on to her dad. Thanatos gets his revenge though when he murders Deimos and makes the mistake of making Kratos even madder than he already is all the time. Deimos and Kratos had just reconciled only for him to get squished by the God of Death who had just turned into a giant monster to fight him. Bet you thought you had to wait longer to hear that again, huh? He also realizes that Kratos is the true subject of the prophecy, just in time for Kratos to crack his chest open and make the God of Death into the God of Being Dead. Which is a victory, sure, but also kicks off his feud with the rest of the gods, who are not stoked about the idea of Kratos eventually murdering all of them. Spoiler alert, he does. We have made it to God of War 2 now, which means we're more than halfway through the chronology of the series. But maybe not through the list of names, since this is where Kratos really starts to step up the rate of his god murdering. Oh, and he also kills Medusa's sister, Eurylee, another Gorgon who isn't technically a god, but we did include her sister on this list, so... It felt like it'd be unfair to leave her out. Plus, just like her sister, her head got cut off and used as a weapon. So that's always fun. Towards the beginning of the game, Kratos is betrayed and killed by Zeus for his refusal to show absolute loyalty to the gods. But he is rescued by the Titan Gaia, who sends him on a quest to find the Sisters of Fate. So he can change his... Change his fate. Why else would you want to find the Sisters of Fate? Come on. One of his first stops in his quest is the Steeds of Time, gigantic titan horses who can move a whole freaking island. But first he has to deal with his horse keeper Theseus, who is way more badass than you'd expect from anyone with the title Horse Keeper. But he does put up a good fight. He is also a legendary warrior, but there's only so much you can do when someone like Kratos wants you dead. And Theseus' death is pretty brutal. After pinning him to a door, Kratos then uses that very same door to crush his head. And I'm not sure there's anything more embarrassing than getting 
fucked up by a door twice, let alone the same door. Whew, what an idiot. An equally brutal fate awaits Perseus, a so-called legendary hero who didn't even kill Medusa in this universe, which is like the thing he's known for, Jesus. And while he's also technically a victim of the Sisters of Fate, that doesn't make it any less satisfying when Kratos stabs him with his own sword, knocks him through a wall, and impales him on a hook, only to use the hole he just created with his body as his escape route. Woo! Sucks to be you, bro. But that brings us to the sisters themselves, who I urge you not to mix up with the Furies from earlier, even though they're also three sisters who are vastly powerful and super gross looking. In order to change his fate though, Kratos needs control of their loom. Technically, the less gross sisters like Hesus and Atropos don't even die. They just get trapped in a mirror, which is then shattered, sealing them away forever. And considering that they literally just tried to go back in time and change the outcome of Kratos' battle with Ares, Seems like they got off easy. But that does bring us to the youngest, grossest, and most dangerous of all sisters, Clotho, a monstrous silkworm-esque being who is built into the loom and spins the threads of fate and time that determine who lives, who dies, and everything in between. Honestly, the vast time-altering powers of the sisters raises more questions about the chronology of the series than it's able to answer. So it's probably for the best that Kratos brutally murders Clotho, so we don't have to worry about it. After a lengthy battle, Kratos impales her head with a part of her own loom, and then uses it to travel back to the moment where Zeus turned on Kratos, technically undoing most of the events of God of War II in the process. Which brings us to God of War II's most significant god death, which isn't nearly as badass or as cool as most of the others, but is still a big deal. When he goes to strike down Zeus once and for all, Athena throws herself on the blade instead, giving the king of the gods a chance to escape. Up to this point, Athena had been an ally of Kratos, but ending the reign of the gods was a step too far for her. And she even strikes one last blow by revealing to Kratos that Zeus is his father, which also means that a bunch of other gods and demigods Kratos killed were technically his cousins or siblings. But he seems less concerned with that than with ending the rule of the gods and breaking the cycle of vengeance. Kratos uses the loom to go back in time and to bring Zeus's own long dead daddy, Kronos, back to bring him down, along with a bunch of other titans. This allows him to finally bring the fight to the gods, stage an assault on Mount Olympus, and hopefully get his vengeance once and for all. Woo, what could possibly go wrong? Enter God of War 3. Turns out a lot can go wrong, because if you thought God of War 2 is heavy on the murder, then get ready for 2010's God of War 3, which has nearly as many dead gods as the other games combined. And they're all big names you know and love from Greek mythology. I mean, he does start off by murdering Poseidon at the beginning of the game, and it does not slow down from there. In fact, the plot of God of War 3 is basically Kratos murders the whole pantheon, uh, which is basically my favorite episode of It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Most of God of War 3 takes place on or around Mount Olympus, picking up with the Titan assault that God of War 2 ended with. Poseidon comes after him with the full power of the ocean, but Kratos rips him out of the massive water construct he's encased himself in, gouges out his eyes, and then snaps his f***ing neck. It's the first murder in the game, and it literally causes a flood that wipes out most of Greece in the first 10 minutes of the game. What the f***? And that's what most of God of War 3 is. Kratos ascending Mount Olympus, f***ing up the gods, and the entirety of Greece in the process. But he has a longer climb than he thought, because after beating the shed of Poseidon, the Titans turn on him as he's cast down into the underworld. Again, it makes sense though, because the Titans are just gods, but you know, bigger, they're bigger gods. On his way through the underworld, Kratos roasts a demigod named Pyrthos with the flames of Cerberus before coming up against Hades himself, who by the way is voiced by Clancy Goddamn Brown. This is not the last time I'll mention how stacked the game's voice cast is. This version of Hades is big and gross, just like all the gods in these games, with massive chained blades that rival those of Kratos. After using those chains like a noose and submerging him in the river Styx, Kratos takes the claws of Hades for himself and uses them to drain Hades' own goddamn soul, giving him a taste of his own damn medicine. Of course, this also causes the world above to be flooded with lost souls who are no longer bound to Hades, but Kratos just isn't too worried about that, so neither am I. After killing Hades, Kratos keeps working his way upward towards the flame of Olympus, because he started at the top, but he just won't stop. That one, Gabrielle, you can use. I don't need your help. 
Next up is Helios, who's a big deal because he literally is the sun. After finding the god injured from a battle with the titan Perseus, Helios begs for his life, attempting all sorts of strategies to keep Kratos from murdering him. But trying to stop Kratos from murdering is like trying to stop Gabrielle from doing an ill-advised rap at the end of this video. It's pointless. So Kratos literally rips off Helios' head with his bare hands, slowly and painfully. Now it is very cool, but it's also very gross. Oh, and it plunges the whole world into darkness, but I'm sure that's fine. As he continues his climb, Kratos also kills the Titan Perseus by plunging his blade into its eye, because there's literally nothing too big for Kratos to murder, let alone stab. Next up is Hermes, whose whole thing is he's just too fast to catch, something he reminds Kratos of constantly. You don't try to catch me because you know you can't. But after taking part in a wild god chase, Kratos manages to injure Hermes enough to slow him down, so he has to catch his breath. After defeating him in battle, Kratos cuts off Hermes' legs, which is the most f***ed up thing you can do to a guy whose whole thing is about running fast. It's like cutting off the Flash's legs, or Sonic's. Oh man, I made myself sad thinking about cutting off Sonic's legs. Kratos cuts off his legs, takes his boots, and unleashes a plague of disease-infested insects upon the land. It's almost like Kratos' quest for vengeance upon the gods has a series of cascading, unforeseen consequences upon mortal creatures that inhabit the land. Who could have possibly foreseen that other than literally every god who warned Kratos about it? Whose fault is it? I don't blame Kratos. Next, Kratos takes on Hercules, who he beats to death with his own gauntlets. Uh, I don't feel the need to talk about this one too much, other than to point out that Hercules is in fact voiced by TV Hercules, Kevin Sorbo, which is pretty damn funny. Now look, I'm not a fan of that guy, but I commend God of War for just Googling the word Hercules and being like, yeah, let's get that guy. After that, Kratos meets Hephaestus, who asks him to go get a magic stone from the stomach of Kronos, Zeus's dad and leader of the Titans, which also would mean that he's Kratos' grandfather super weird to think about. Just another big boy for Kratos to rip to shreds. Although he does have to uh, get swallowed alive first, but it's not the first or last time he's gonna have that experience. After finding the stone, Kratos slices his way out of Kronos' stomach before stabbing his dear old granddad right in the forehead. I mean, I can't judge. I mean, who among us hasn't murdered their own grandfather, am I right? Huh? Anyone? Kratos takes the stone back to Hephaestus, who immediately betrays him because of course he does. This is where I should point out that Hephaestus is voiced by the late, great Rip Torn because the game's cast is insane. I'm not gonna talk at length about the character of Daedalus because he's immortal, but that guy's voiced by Malcolm McDowell. Come on, Malcolm McDowell! Sorry, back to Hephaestus, who Kratos impales with his own anvil, though he doesn't have any hard feelings about it since the dude was just trying to protect his daughter. But still, at least he got an ironic poetic death at the hands of his own instruments, which is really the most you can ask for if you're a god in this universe. Kratos continues his journey to the flame, passing through Hera's garden, where the queen of the gods talks a whole bunch of shit as he attempted to find a way out of her maze. When she says something disparaging about Pandora, Kratos snaps, which I mean both figuratively and literally. He loses control, but also snaps her neck, which seems to be the go-to thing for his murder methods. Now, if you're assuming that murder also had some sort of terrible effect on the world below, you'd be right. Hera's death kills basically all of plants. And hey, plants aren't essential in any way. They're not important to life at all, right? Right, everyone? That brings us to the last of the god murders of the Greek era, as Kratos takes on his father, Zeus, and the Titan Gaia at the same time. In fact, he and Zeus literally duke it out inside of Gaia because there's nothing cooler than killing a god while you're inside of another god. Kratos wounded Gaia earlier in the game as vengeance for her betrayal during the assault on Olympus. But when he stabs Zeus through the chest into Gaia's heart, that seems to do the trick, or at least part of it. Gaia dies, crushing most of Olympus in the process, but Zeus's spirit keeps f***ing with Kratos because he's just that much of a spiteful dick. Eventually, Kratos restores his powers by forgiving himself for what he did to his wife and daughter, which I promise kind of makes sense in context due to the mechanics of Pandora's box, which we don't really have time to get into right now. But after coming to terms with his guilt and putting Zeus's spirit back into his body, Kratos beats his dad to death with his bare hands. 
because that's always more satisfying than using a weapon, which is something I know from experience. It's not as creative as some of the other murders, although he does grab Zeus by the beard at one point, which probably felt pretty great. It carries the weight of the emotional culmination of the whole series though, so it's still very satisfying. When the spirit of Athena asks him to restore her power, so the new pantheon can restore the world that Kratos' murder spree unleashed, he turns his murder powers on himself instead, committing his final act of deicide and leaving the world once and for all. Except, obviously, that's not true because there's a whole other gang. Sometime after wiping out the whole Greek pantheon, Kratos moves into the realm of the Norse gods, remarrying and having a son, Atreus. God of War 2018, full stop, is a damn masterpiece, but we're not gonna actually spend too long on it because it doesn't have that much god murder in it. And also because I can't wait much longer to hear Gabrielle's murder rap at this point, because it's gotta be, it's gotta be good, right? You've been hyping it up all along. I hope it's good. And just to clarify, there's still plenty of murder in this game. It's just that most of the murderees are monsters or ghouls or elves or trolls. There's one dope troll whose heart Kratos rips out in the realm of Helheim named Madagir Helsin. He's not a god, but he has a name and it's a very cool name. So I thought it was worth bringing up. The first actual god Kratos murders in the Norse era is Magni, one of the two sons of Chris Hemsworth. I'm sorry, I mean Thor. He slices Magni with his axe before slamming the blade right into his smug little face. The other brother, Modi, gets away, but is eventually murdered by Kratos' son, Atreus, in a moment of rage, because if this game has taught me anything, it's that no matter how many gods you kill, the cycle of violence never be lives on in the next generation. Family. Kratos also kills nine Valkyries, assuming that the player is brave enough to take them on. I'm not entirely sure if the Valkyries qualify as gods, but they do allow Kratos to revisit one of his favorite hobbies, which is ripping off the wings off of people. So even though they put up a good fight, it's simply not enough whether they're technically gods or not. And that brings us to the final god murder of the series so far. Holy shit, I can't believe we made it. Whew, I hope you're ready, Gabrielle. You're the one who isn't ready. You know, it's hard to argue with that. The headlining fight in 2018's God of War is definitely Kratos' multiple showdowns with Baldur, a god who shows up at Kratos' doorstep looking for someone who can make him feel something, literally anything, even if it's pain. Baldur's mother Freya made him invincible, but at the cost of trapping him in a feelingless life, he desperately wants to escape. The fights between Baldur and Kratos literally crack mountains, but neither of them is able to do any lasting damage to one another, due to their godly powers. When Kratos and Atreus discover that his invulnerability can be bypassed by Mistletoe though, the two of them work together in a super dope moment of father-son bonding, filling the guy with arrows, before Kratos falls back on another one of his favorite pastimes and snaps the dude's neck. Oh, and they have this whole fight on and around a reanimated giant's corpse because of course they do. When he kills Baldur, Freya swears vengeance because that cycle of violence and revenge just keeps rearing its ugly head. And with God of War Ragnarok coming around the corner, I have no doubt that Kratos' murder spree is far from over. I can't wait to see how he f***s up Thor or Odin or any number of Norse gods whose names I don't even try to pronounce because I've ruined them all at this point. If God of War 2018 is any indication, this era is a bit more introspective when it comes to murder and generally reckons with themes of violence and revenge. That doesn't mean it isn't cool as hell because I contain multitudes and can appreciate murder in all of its forms whether or not I'm the one committing it. I gotta stop doing this whole bit with the ax thing, huh? All right, Gabrielle, come on out here. It's finally time for your wrap. I hope everyone's ready. You'll never believe what I got to rhyme with Theseus. <laughs> Reese's Pieces? All right, shut up, shut up. Okay. I'm gonna do this now. Okay. <laughs> Drop, keep, ready, bro. The last out. Oh. You put a lot of effort into that. Yeah. yeah. Can I have this back? Maybe. Cool. It's your turn. <laughs> well, on that note, <laughs> go check out God of Work, season one, available on my YouTube channel. Gabrielle directed it. People, Zipper, who wrote this video, wrote it. And uh, we had a bunch of great people on the show. Go watch it. My YouTube channel, link on screen right now. It's good. You're gonna like it.